Hello, and welcome to my review of Stephen Erickson's Gardens of the Moon, a tale of the Malazan, Book of the Fallen. And if that subtitle has you going, huh? Welcome to my world, or Erickson's world anyway. And this is a world too. This series alone is 10 books and 3 million words long. There's another series by its co-creator Ian Cameron Esselmont that's 6 books long. Both series have a series of prequels, and then there's various novellas as well. It's a world you're never going to leave. Whether that's as much fun as the inside of Lady Simtall's bedroom or Anna Amanda Rake's sword is at this stage something I won't commit to. So the plot is convoluted, and if I attempt to explain it all in this video, it will probably end up at 3 million words long as well. So let's suffice to say there's a legendary squad of soldiers, treated badly by the rulers, who, after being nearly wiped out in one siege, are sent ahead to infiltrate the city next on their tyrannical empress's hit list. In that city, there's a whole bunch of Dungeons and Dragons style thieves, assassins and alchemists etc, all doing various role playing game stuff. Gary Gygax, it seems, rolled a 5 and a 6. So there's the good, the bad and the ugly. The characters are solid, some at least seem very human. There's nobility, strength, weakness, humour, pettiness, mood swings and insanity all scattered all over the place. And as I suggested earlier, that's because there's a lot of characters. Generally though, they do what Erickson needs them to in the way of evoking the desired emotional reaction. One character I particularly enjoyed was the egotist Krupp. He is the obvious comic relief, but it's done well enough. The magic in Erickson's world has some of the best, most well-developed lore I've seen. The idea of all these warrens and their interactions with both the mages and each other was interesting, and when the mages duel, it gives this novel a fresher feel than the interminable clashing of swords and shields you get with some series. Some reviews have spoken of Erickson's moral ambiguity. I think that mostly comes from the way the conflict changes. At first, the Malazan forces are opposed to rakes, but when the focus shifts to Darujistan, both sides have their stories told to the same extent, though from the off it's clear that the Empress Lucine is the real bad guy, and that the two sides will eventually have to pool their resources. Both sides have heroes and villains in their ranks. Yes, the Malazan infiltrators do plot to do some bad things, but they don't go through with them. On the whole, it's tamer and much more clear-cut than I was expecting. Only Perrin, who starts as a fish out of water, becomes a committed and loyal servant of the Empress before challenging that commitment, experiences any meaningful personal change. But because that cast of characters is so crowded, he gets a little lost and it's hard really to care much about him. That ensemble is both a strength and a weakness. The plot I already said was convoluted could easily be described as a mess. The sorry mystery that builds up over 400 pages or so is wiped out with a disdainful wave of a hand. The bad guys seem to be on a limited timeshare deal here as well. At first we're told it's Rake, then it's Taysha and the Wizard, and then it's Herlock, and then it's Sorry or her patrons Shadowfang and Cotillion, then it's the adjunct with a plan to release the Jagat Tyrant, then it's the Tyrant, for a very brief interlude it's the Lady Simtal, then it's the Galean Lord, and before any of that is even resolved, we're told that they're actually all insignificant compared to the unseen Panny and Seer. And then there's the Empress Lucene, of course. This lack of focus makes things very episodic. The threat level in the city has been set to severe for so long that nobody pays it any mind anymore. For example, while the terrible awful Jagat Tyrant is marching on the city, intent on destroying everything, the entire cast of characters goes to a party. Erickson utterly wastes the dragons. It's almost like somebody said, it can't be a fantasy novel without dragons, mate. So he just threw them in to be cool. The fight between the Tyrant and the dragons should have been the book's centerpiece. Instead, none of his characters act like they even care, so why should his audience? There are times as well that this book has so many different gods, warrens, elder races, tribes and titles on the same page that it would basically be gibberish without the glossary and the dramatis personae. It's probably good world building to Malazan fans, but I doubt it makes it more accessible to casual readers. A second reading of this novel would be extremely advantageous and more likely to draw out some of its strengths. The novel really feels like a throwback. Though published in 1999, it seemed more like something from the 1980s. Particularly the dialogue and the cheesy way almost every scene ends with the character talking to themselves. I'll put an example of my favourites up on the screen. Quite often, Gardens of the Moon feels like a tribute to the worlds of Feist, Eddings and Gygax, 
and I am aware that that could be taken as quite a compliment, because while in my review of The Ghost Brigades I discussed how that novel borrows from its influences but fails to create its own place, I wouldn't say the same was true here. Gardens is actually strong enough that its own merits carry you through to see how things will turn out, and that's despite all the sequel baiting and the lacklustre way some of the various threads are actually ended along the way. There's so much going on generally that at least some of it is good. Overall, I'd say Gardens of the Moon is a messy novel, veering wildly from moments of real quality and inspiration to others that feel very dated or clunky. The convoluted plot has real issues with pacing, but some strong or interesting situations and characters make up for those. I quite enjoyed it, but I can't envisage committing any more time to this series, even though, from its longevity and the evidence here, I'm quite sure that it will get stronger and better as it goes along. Though, with that being said, I'd recommend it only to die-hard fantasy readers and fans of Feist and Eddings who have exhausted those huge back catalogues and are looking for something that is new, but not that new. Even then, I recommend it with the warning that like those imprisoned in Rake's Magic Sword, once this series hooks you in, you can never leave. Thank you for listening, and goodbye. If you liked this video, or even if you think Shadowfrone should send his hounds to pay me a visit, the like, dislike, comment and subscribe buttons are there for you to use as you see fit, and I have a lot more videos just like this one on my channel, so if that doesn't sound as unappealing to you as the Hellock and Judy puppet show, why not check some of them out?